Right guys, before we start with Rob, can we just all please give Mark Cucking another big round of applause please. Cheers Mark. Okay guys, we've got, well we all know Rob, Rob Freeman. He's a Okay, right, I don't want to say much more. Rob Freeman, um, basically, Sam, just let the man speak. Please don't interrupt. Uh, I know you'd be lots of questions for him afterwards. Um, I'll just pass you straight over to him then again. Rob Freeman, thank you. Blimey. 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 Blimey, that first clap in my life, I felt like a celebrity there. Yeah? Right, brilliant. Uh, fantastic talk by Mark on the ways. I can't see what he expects. But yet, yeah, where is he? Fantastic stuff, fantastic. It's all downhill from now on, I'm afraid. I can't follow that. But uh, a, co a, a totally different thing. Um, if, if you can't hear, if you keep pulling away, it just gives a shout. A totally different kind of talk I'm going to be doing. Um, when I've listened to Mark, is is technical information. That's one of those talks that I've just got to keep playing back, looking at it again, um, and trying to let let it absorb in stages because just fantastic stuff that. Um, and I thought, well, my talk's nowhere near uh, as technically, uh, the information's nowhere near as technically good as that. I think Mark's probably been studying, well, not studying, but researching for 30 years or so. Uh, but I started looking at this thing I've put together here, and it's kind of, seem, it's kind of saying very similar things, but in a less technical way. So today you're going to get both sides of the spectrum, the really technical information that we can take our time and make sure we absorb it. Um, and simple stuff from myself, who's just a fat lump from Sheffield, who's fairly intelligent, but the thing I do seem to be able to do is take something that's complicated to me um, and, and, and articulate it out in a more simple way. So that's what this is all about, but like I say, it's almost like the same kind of thing. Yeah, so, um, I feel a bit nervous, that's not like me. In fact, I think I've had an accident now. Like <laughs> right, so, um, that information with that... Um, Technical, we were all sat quiet, weren't we? So uh, we can make a bit of noise. Let's see what we've got in. We're in Manchester. Have we got any, are they Mancunians? Are they Mancunians? Hey! <laughs> Mad for it. Uh, anyone from Yorkshire? Yeah. Nicely, nicely. I think there's a lot of Yorkshire people here. Any Geordies? Yeah. Just the one? <laughs> oh, just the one tick here. I've got no oh, is it two of you? Oh, sorry. Are you Scottish people? See you. Yeah, nice one. Uh, anyone from Kuala Lumpur? Kuala Lumpur? Any Kuala Lumpurs in? No? No? Pardon? Say again? Hungary? Oh, who's from Coventry? Who's from Coventry? Put your hand up. Where do you get sent when no one's talking to you? We get sent to Coventry, yes. Anyway, what the bollocks. Right, okay, so today's talk's quite a different talk for me because I'm well known for this law and commerce stuff. We'll take that off. Do you know I've got them pinhole glasses that's, has anybody seen pinhole glasses? Yeah. yeah. they're great aren't they? Yeah. Don't sit on them. My eyes are getting really good at it and then I've sat on them so I'm back right, to Right, so I've called this talk The Occult World of Reflection. Hmm, interesting. I've called it reflect, The Occult World of Reflection. Occult, um, uh, from my research, just means something hidden or something secret. Esoteric, that's all it is. It's got, I'll talk to this side as well. It's got negative connotations but the occult is something hidden something um, only given to the initiated, so that's basically a cult. Do you want to go past me? No, you're fine, Rob, just continue. Oh, okay. And so I thought, I thought, uh, I'll call it the occult one of reflection. So, um, what's reflection? Well, we know what reflection is. I'll give you a definition of reflection if I can find it. Hold on. This is not like me to have an ounce either, by the way. Let's have a look. See if I can find you what the definition I got of reflection. Okay, reflection. Uh, I think this is from the Oxford Dictionary. And we know there's all different kinds of words, there's legalese and all different kinds of words. But from the Oxford Dictionary, uh, reflection. It said, uh, bear in mind I've called it the occult world of reflection. Um, the throwing back by a body or surface of, of... Sorry, I'll start again. Reflection. The throwing back by a body or surface of light, heat or sound without absorbing it. That's reflection. And serious thought and consideration. That's why I've called it the occult world of reflection. 
What we need to use, it's not the standard reflection that we tell, they tell us about, although it's that as well, it's serious thought and consideration. That's the reflection I'm talking about. Okay, um, I'm going to cover all sorts of stuff here. Basically, the, the occult, the, some of the techniques that they use against us, but more importantly for me, um, this talk for me, I'll put it this way again, this way as, as well. This talk for me really is, um, I've been doing this for a lot of, a lot of years now, uh, and we feel like we're not getting anywhere and people saying oh, we've got to group together and we're all split up and stuff but this last year I've seen a massive massive difference of people just being awake and so for me this is um, it's December, it's end of year for me end of year for us all 2013 for me has been a fantastic year uh, so what this is for me is a celebration I mean all you lot sat here all day long um, I can remember when I first went to talks, well, I don't know, six years ago, there were like three men and a dog, there were nobody there. And I see people every week now are going to do different talks, there's stuff on the internet. So this mass awakening that's supposed to be happening and people can't see it, it is happening, people are getting awake, people are waking up every single day. And all we've got to really do is communicate with each other and learn this sort of information that Mark's come out. And that's going to take me quite a while to learn that sort of stuff, but it's, we're moving forward. Um, so the system of control that's in place, I don't know, I don't know who's controlling us, I don't know, like Mark was saying, they talk about the Illuminati, the elite, and, well, there's the Jesuits, and there's, there's all different groups, isn't there, Freemason this and Freemason that, and there's all these different subgroups, um, and they're all using, in my opinion, um, they are all, at the highest level, manipulating energy in some way, in some form or, or other. For me that's what it's all about, um, the manipulation of energy. So what I want to do today, today is um, go through a few things of, a few different methods that they're using, um, and towards the end of the talk, and it's probably not, not going to be all that long, but towards the end of the talk, um, what we can do, or sorry, I will never tell anyone what to do, but what I, what I do, personally what I do, like I say, I'm well known for the law and commerce stuff, and people say, oh, you, you, um, you get loads of victories and stuff, uh, you don't pay anything or whatever it is. And what I've been trying to tell people for about six years now is, um, it's not really about winning and losing, it's about, it's about knowing who you are and identifying just who and what you are. And when that happens, uh, when, sorry, when you do that, things fall into place, um, and information comes exactly when you need it, when you're ready for it. And it's not a question of getting results. It's a question of um, it's a question of it's a question of realizing exactly who and what we are uh, again in terms of energy, and that and that without anybody who's got who's, who's got a perceived authority over you or tries to tell you what to do and what to abide by laws, legislation as we know is fictional. And for me, it's all about. Um, any authority is perceived authority, okay? If you don't cause harm to another living soul in any form, there's nothing and nobody on this planet can stop you doing for what you want to do. And all these techniques and all this fantastic numeracy and all these fantastic stuff, for me, and that's just me saying it, this is all bollocks. Because you stand, um, stand in your own power, stand in your own light, and try to do every act that you do, and try to think every thought that you do, for me, it's, to act, it's all about acting in honour and dishonour. And if you act honourably, in everything you do, every day I help somebody with something, it might be something small, but it comes back a thousand times. And for me, this is all we've got to do to beat this shit, is to realise that we're all one family. I'm not bothered at what anybody says about anything. We're all part of each other. And as I carry on with this talk, we're all part of everything else. It's, it is fractal. Is, it, is that the word, fractal? So basically we are all connected and once we start realising that and stop this division and standing on a, you know, if you do something against, or if you do, sorry, if you do an act, you know whether you're acting on or dishonour. We don't need any fucking uh, politicians, police, judges or anything to tell us. We know what's right, we know what's wrong. And either way, we're looking at, as my friend here says, cause, consequence, what's the other Effect. <laughs> cause, con thank you. Cause, consequence, and effect. That's every action and even every thought that we do will come back. You reap what you sow. So you're acting on it, you try and help people, 
and it'll always come back and th things will work out. So, that's the gist of what I'm trying to do today, so very different to Mark's talk. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go through some of the stuff that they use. Now, I ain't got as much time as I thought, so I'll have to skip some of this shite. So, what I thought I'd do is tell you some of the stuff that they've done. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll show you this first. And this is, um, I'm going to touch a little bit of law and commerce stuff, but that's what I'm known for, but not, not just law and commerce, a bit of everything, because everything's connected. So I'll just show you, I'll just show you the system that's in, the system, the system. I'll just show you the system that's in place. Okay, this is how it uh, should work. This is how it should work. Just talk amongst yourselves. Okay. This board might fall over. That says corporation. It don't. It don't look supposed to. Okay. Is that camera picking that up? I'll go this side. Okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Well, oh, has anyone got an hamster? Just, just trying on a lumpy carpet. Hold on. Did that last, did that last time, huh? That's a, okay, this is how it should work. Creator, whoever, whether you say God or whatever, creator, excuse me. <coughs> this is the order it should work in. Creator. Creator rules over man. Man, constructed government, rules over government, government, created corporations, rules over corporations, that's how it should work. The cult world of reflection, it's completely opposite, isn't it? I don't know if you can see, but it's gone the other way, hasn't it? Corporations run now everything. Yeah, corporations now tell governments what to do, and governments as corporations as well now. Corporations oppress man. And man, has been conned out of realising who God or Creator is. So everything's in reverse, everything's in reflection, yeah? Okay, the very word world, we live in a world, we always use the word world, don't we? There's not such a thing as a world, it's commercial. We live on planet Earth. The world is a commercial construct. You don't, what is a world? You don't go to the world, do you? It's planet Earth, and it's us, the inhabitants. So when they talk about, um, when they talk about a world, they're talking about commerce and business. Okay. So what I thought I should show, I thought, what I do to start off with, listen to this, you might like this, or you might not. I thought, um, there's a lot of movies out there that are telling us what they're doing. Um, we've got, obviously, The Matrix. Matrix films, if you've not, has anybody not seen The Matrix? Brilliant. Oh, what was that? Have you not seen it? I went to see it, I was not Did you? Yeah, watch them, watch them, watch them over again. Um, there's a few films, there's um, Cloud Atlas. Cloud, excuse me, Cloud Atlas. What did somebody say then? Wizard of Oz. Who said that? Yeah, Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz. brilliant. Um, what else is it? Inception, Inception's a good one. Anyway, there's loads of movies, and uh, same in music. What they've done is, there's a, there's a small band of, I don't know what they are yet, maybe we'll figure it out today. Uh, a, small va a small band of very, very intelligent people controlling the masses really, a very small band. How they do it, Mark explained it. Mine's very simple, but it's about manipulating energy um, and tricking us into consent. Now, they have to have our consent, okay? They either force us into it um, through fear, their system of control is fear, okay? So they impose fear on us to make us consent. Well, that's forced consent, that's not consent, it's not an agreement, is it? But that's how they do it. Or the trickers into it with their trickery, the magicians, the magi, M A G I, any word with M A G? Magistrates. Magistrates, um, magnetism, Magna Carta, any word with M A G is a very, very important word. So they're using um, basically magic. The magic is the manipulation of energy, and that's how they're getting us to consent to everything they're doing, okay? Later on, I'll try and explain why I think they need our consent. Because why don't they just go ahead and force us? Why don't the Mechas do all this horrible stuff? Um, and from what I've researched, they can't make us do it. They have to have our consent. Well, I'll cover that in a bit. So, going back to the movies and stuff. I thought, well, I'll, I'll, ex I'll tell you about a movie and I'll just run through it quick and see what sort of symbolism and what's the real meaning. Is anybody, anybody else over 40? 
Go on, don't be shy, I'm, you know, oh, it's a lot here, I'm flipping out, it's like how he pays his social for yeah. Great. Okay, so rather than doing movies, I thought I'll do this one. I thought, see if you recognise this, this is an old television series and made it to films. Um, I, thought, I thought I'll research it, see if there's any hidden meaning. Flipping believe it, it's full of it. Full of it. Right, I'll tell you how you saw it. Right, this is how we should start. Space, the final frontier. Can you remember that? Do you remember it? Yeah? Uh, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly, oh, bold spot, to boldly go where no man's gone before. Can you remember that? Oh, you remember old Star Trek? Yeah? So I thought, well, uh, I saw it as a little kid. I saw it as a really little kid. Um, and I thought, that's brilliant, because they had nice uniforms, and uh, I liked Luke Tentner Hora. You remember, she was, she was lovely, I had a crush on her for about 29 years. Uh, and I always used to like it, I thought, it's a great series. And I started studying it, um, researching it. Listen to this, this uh, I'll take five minutes. Well, this is just an example of how they can control our minds through entertainment. I'll tell you what entertainment is a bit. It's really entrainment, not entertainment, but I'll tell you about it in a bit. Okay, this is what I found out about Star Trek. Get this. Try and make it short. Uh, it, it says Star Trek is an American science fiction television series created by Gene Roddenberry. Okay, Gene, G-E-N-E. -E. Straight away, alarm bells are ringing, aren't they? As in Genesis, Gene. Okay, that follows the adventures of uh, the Starship Enterprise. Oh, what's an Enterprise? It's a business, isn't it? What I found out is that the whole Star, the whole Star Trek thing is an, a corporation, namely a religious corporation, the Vatican and Christianity, going out into, going out into space, um, backed by Freemasonry. That's what Star Trek's about. How can it be about that? And it is. Well, I think it is. Okay, so the events of the Starship USS Enterprise, uh, serial number NCC-1701 and its crew. Okay. The show is set in the Milky Way galaxy roughly during the 2260s. That, that's the year it was set. I didn't know it was Milky Way either until I did this. Uh, the crew is headed by Captain James T. Kirk, First Officer Spock, Chief Medical Officer, blah, 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 Dr. McCoy, um, Shatner's voice, Shatner, oh, William Shatner, William Shatner's voice over introduction during each episode, opening credits, stated the Starship's purpose. For the first 10 years, I wondered who Captain Slog was. Remember, I used to think, who the fuck's Captain Slog? It's Captain Slog, isn't it? But I thought it was Captain Slog. <laughs> I were thick in them days. Okay, I know. Who's well, this Captain Slog? Uh, executive producer Gene Roddenberry, get this. Producer Gene L. Coon, another Gene, so that's two sets of genes in there. Uh, another producer, John Meredith Lucas. Ooh. Uh, theme music by Alexander Courage. A strange name. Okay, so. Let's have this first main character. Does anyone remember Captain James T. Kirk, yeah? Okay. What I found out is James, his first name, is reference to the King James Bible, which it is. The authorised, the only authorised Bible, isn't it? Authorised, because it's, it's been rewritten, that's why it's been authorised. So, okay, James T. Kirk. James is, um, James is reference to the King James Bible. Um, T, James T. Kirk, I thought was... Who said that? Nice one. The T is also the it's also the towel cross, isn't it, and everything else. But from my brilliant friend Paul, sent me a bit more information which I've forgotten about. His middle name it was Tiberius. Okay, James Tiberius Kirk. That that's the main that's the main character, yeah? So what's Tiberius? I may have lost it, oh I don't know. Okay, I got this from Paul, our governor, he said, get this, the name Simeon or Shimon is a given name from the Hebrew, okay? also known as Simon, Tiberian, and Simon, okay. In Greek, it's written a different way with S-Y-M-E-N. Okay, so Simeon, in Hebrew, equals um, Tiberian, okay, it means St. Peter. So then we've got James T. Kirk, James Tiberius, King James, uh, Authorised King James Bible, Tiberius, St. Peter. Does anybody know what Kirk means? Who said that? Yeah, exactly. So Kirk, K-R-K-I-R-K, -K -K, came from, uh, is it Circe, or Kirk, in fact it was uh, spelt Kirk sometimes. She was a goddess of some sort, who was she, I'll tell you who she was. She was a goddess pharmakia, okay, a witch or a sorceress. Uh, her name was sometimes spelt, hold on, hold on. Ooh, dropping pens. 
Sometimes she was called, this is where we get the word church from, by the way. I don't know if you can see that. Sometimes her name was spelt, boom, 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 Kirky, okay? The Scottish name Kirk derives from that. Kirk means church, I'll stand over here a bit. So Kate okay, means church. Lost my paper. Okay, so there's the first reference to um, Scotland, Scottish Freemasonry. Uh, as people, I'm sure you know that Freemasonry, the I story is a Scottish Freemasonry. Okay, so Captain James T. Kirk, we know it's pushing the Bible, which is commerce, um, a corporation into space. Okay, and it said our five year mission, that's a five year plan. Anyway, I'll try and circumvent this and make it a bit quicker. Okay, let's have an oh, original character. Before Kirk, they had a pilot. They had two pilots, in fact. Um, a pilot, as in a first episode, to practice. First one got scrapped, but original character's name, get this, Christopher Pike. Christ over Pike. Okay. He was the original character, and they sacked him off after trail, and then got Captain James T. Kirk in. So I had a bit of digging round, okay. Um, could be a... Could be a reference Christ of Christopher Pike could be a reference to Albert Pike, a well known Freemason, as we know, high initiate. Um, he obviously he, pu he published a book called uh, Morals and Dogma about the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. So, once again, another reference to Freemasonry. Anyway, Christopher Pike got the sack after one pilot, excuse me, <coughs> and then James T. Kerr come in. I'll try to make it a bit quicker. So, we've covered Kerr, get this one, you're going to like this, or you might not. Uh, can't read me on my team. Okay, Mr. Spock, I remember it. Give me um, I thought, well, that can't be a reference to anything. Oh, by the way, the Bible is the best selling book in the world. So I did a bit of digging. This might not be right, this is just my theory, but Mr. Spock, okay, maybe taken from. Does anybody remember Dr. Spock, who wrote a book? Yeah. yeah, well, his name was Benjamin McLean Spock. There's another Scottish reference there. Okay. Um, Dr. Spock, Benjamin McLean Spock, he wrote, he was a paediatrician, he wrote a book called um, Baby and Child Care in 1946, okay, it says here throughout its first 52 years, Baby and Child Care was the second best book, second best selling book of all time next to the Bible, so they've got the two best selling books there into space, it's all commerce is what I'm trying to tell you, I'll make it a bit quicker, uh, Dr. McCoy, um, remember Bones? I don't know why I'm just talking to you, I don't know as if you... It's just us, forget that, it's, it's just us. It's just us Trekkies. It's just us Trekkies. Uh, I'll go to this I keep standing on my ear, Alex, hang on. <laughs> so I do. Uh, yeah, so Dr McCoy, yeah, McCoy, McCoy is a common surname of Scottish or origin in the lands of Kintyre, and then it moved to, uh, and then it moved to Irish. Uh, an Anglicisation, I can't say that, um, of its Irish Gaelic is Makoda meaning son of Oda meaning fire. Okay, so there's a Scottish reference again. She's breaking up, Captain. Can you remember him all the time? Scotty, we're going to have an engineer. Every two minutes he's fucking breaking up. Well, it was useless, isn't it? Heavy we're breaking up all the time, wasn't it? I think it would have made that a bloody polystyrene. Well, there we are, uh, Mr. Scott. Character's name Montgomery Scott. Uh, Chief engineer. Chief engineer. Got a bit of a sweat on. Um, another, so Scottish Freemasonry powering the vessel again into space. I'll make this quick so he's dragging on forever. <coughs> Mr. Sulu, no, he's not Scottish, is he? No. Yeah. Sulu, uh, translation of Sulu is uh, like water, diluted, and a watery fluid. Okay, that's Admiralty Law taken into space under commerce. It sounds bollocks, this, doesn't it? It's right, well, I think it's right. Uh, my favourite woman, Lieutenant Uhura. I can't tell that. Uhura. Um, comes from the Swahili word, Uhuru, meaning freedom. Okay, I'll run through this quick now. Chekhov, the only Russian I think he was, Pavel, Pavel Chekhov. So I had a quick look to see if I could find any references and I found Anton Pavlovich Chekhov, who was a Russian physician and author. Uh, he was considered to be the greatest writer of short stories in history. So the only Russian in there when he got... When did you ever see a storyline about Chekhov? I never saw one. So he only got the short story bits. Um, last character that you may or may not know of. We'll know this some more, yeah? Last, next to the last character, Christine Chapel was a character in Star Trek. Christine, Christian Chapel. It's all religious, isn't it? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Written by Jean Roddenberry. She was written in. I'll skip through this. I think that's a bit better. Uh, another one, Janice Rand, a character. Okay, played by Grace Lee Whitney. 
could be, and I'm not sure about this, could be a reference to Ayn Rand. Does anybody know Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand? The lady Ayn Rand? Is it Ayn or Ayn? Say again. Anne? Yeah, it's A-Y-M. Okay. Could be a reference to Anne Rand. A real name? Elisa Rosenbaum. Okay. It's supposed to be American, but she's born in Russia. Novelist, philosopher and all that stuff. Wrote some great books. Uh, but her real name was... Um, Elisa Rosenbaum. Okay, Rosenbaum meant rose tree or red tree. Mm, interesting. Okay. Gene Roddenberry, who created it, Roddenberry uh, is an Americanized version of the Dutch and German name Rodenberg, meaning red mountain. So we've got a red tree and a red mountain. Okay, I'll just finish off this now. It's dragging on forever, isn't it? Enterprise, which is a business, had a serial number. USS uh, stood for United Spaceship. Get this. It's um, it's serial number NCC-1701. Does anybody remember seeing that? I must have watched it a thousand times. Okay, does it mean, oh, it's supposed to be, NCC was supposed to be just a registration lettering for a commercial aircraft. Well, what we found out is, and it might not be right, but it sounds right, okay. Um, okay, I'm just circumventing a bit and, and, and going down it. Okay, NCC-1701 could well be it's supposed to, oh, 1701 is supposed to be the first ship of the 17th Federation. But what we found out is NCC-1701 could be a reference to Yale University. Okay? By the way, Dr. Spock went to Yale University. Do people know about Yale University, yeah? Does anybody know? Skull and bones and all that stuff. Okay. Very secret and hidden, dodgy stuff. Okay, NCC. Um, Yale University at that um Yale University used to be in New Haven, it used to be New Haven Colony of Connecticut, NCC, okay, before American Revolution days, um, and Yale University was founded in 1701, so NCC, 1701. Yeah, so I thought I'd just tell you how, how um, films, television programmes, even, I just thought I'd tell you how films, television, um, music and stuff affects us. Now, does it affect us? I don't know. Uh, but it's there for a reason, and there's a lot of work gone into that. Into that series, into the writing, into the characters. And if you look at some of the, um, look at some of the dodgy, um, oh, I've got a little bit earlier, look at some of the um, Klingons. I've all had trouble with Klingons at one time, I don't know what I have. Oh, it's horrible, isn't it? Um, some of the baddies were called Rom Romulans and Remans. It's like Roman emperors, isn't it? Um, McCoy, in Irish, meant uh, a Celtic native meaning fire. And Spock with a Vulcan, named after Vulcan, Roman god of fire. So it's all symbology, isn't it? I don't know why I even told you that, but I skipped that. So what I'm saying is we're being manipulated um, through symbology, through energy uh, manipulation and all sorts. Okay, let's get that on. I'll tell you what, which are some words that they use? Okay, we're being oppressed by words. Um, the whole language thing, there's legalese, which I presume most of you know about, is used in courts and stuff. Um, and we don't really know what it means. The Freemasons have got their own kind of language as well. Um, I think a type of Norman French is used in courts as well. So basically, we're using words. This is part of the enslavement and the manipulation of energy. Um, when I was a little kid, I went to a Catholic school. Um, again, I'll roll that back again. Um, and we used to have to read the Bible a couple of times a week. And I can always remember the beginning of the Bible, it said, um, it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. And I remember thinking, I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And what it's saying is you speak, you speak your words into reality, that's how it works. So the whole language thing has been manipulated so that we don't know what the frig we're really saying. What I'm saying now is absolute bollocks, because it's, <laughs> it is, I'm talking double dutch, I'm talking out my arse, because I think I'm saying something, but we, um, I want to come to it in a bit, because everything is a sound vibration, um, excuse me, <coughs> I'm saying something different by these words that have been constructed for us, if that makes any sort of sense. Okay, so the whole language thing has been manipulated. Now, we're going to come to kind of solutions at the end, and part of that thing about language is to stamp our intentions on what we're saying. Don't matter what they try and manipulate us into, <coughs> we say what our intent, it's all about intentions. Mm -hmm. It's what we speak and what our intentions are behind things. Okay, so we are being manipulated by language. So I just thought I'd tell you, look at some of the words that we use, and I thought I'd stay away from 
legalese and that sort of stuff. Uh, Congress. Americans talk about Congress. Um, Congress is just sex. Um, congresses, it comes from Congresses. A lot of this stuff, these words that we're using, uh, the, you know about the, the you've got um, seven main chakras that you use. Seven main chakras that are open. They want to keep us in the base chakra, they want to keep us down. Um, and so a lot of things, um, the words we use is reverting back to sex, but we don't really know. So Congress comes from Congresses. Okay, that's where they get in America the word Congress from. Okay, Congresses, get this. The extreme practical test of the truth of a change of impotence brought against a husband by a wife. So it's about, um, it's about impotence, it's about sex. Commerce. The word commerce that's used a lot is sex again, believe it or not. The interchange of, mu uh, sorry, the interchange or mutual change of goods, productions, ooh, ooh, or property uh, of any kind between nations or individual. Individuals, sorry. So when a man and woman get married um, and they have sex, they're actually engaged in commerce, which is why you need a marriage certificate. You have to be licensed to engage in commerce. Um, also leading to any children that are born, that's why they create the birth certificate. So believe it or not, um, commerce is sex. Transportation is sex again. Because transportation is the means by which commerce is carried on. So, oh, I've dropped my pen right now. So, this is what I'm saying, we've been tricked by these words and we don't really know what the hell we're talking about. Uh, scrap some of this off. Uh, well, I'll scrap some of that off. Oh, 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 can I do, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, I'll get off of this word thing, I just, I just, oh, I'll, I'll do it. You can throw stuff at me, throw your glasses at me. <laughs> by the way, look at Statum, yeah, I'm trying to grow really long hair. Oh, I'll tell you why I'm growing long hair, I've brought you something in a bit. It's, and it's working, I've been doing it now for about six months, I'll tell you why I'm growing my hair, looks, looks a twat, I know, but there's a reason why I'm growing it though. Right, hang on. I don't know if I can write this, you might have to add, edit this, mate. In fact, I'll write it wrong. I'll write it dyslexically. Dys that's dyslexic, is that even a word? Dy I'll write it dyslexically. You know this word, look, but not, but not, but not spelled like that. Can, can everybody see that? But obviously it's not spelled like that, is it? It's, pretend, I know. I spelt it wrong though, thank God. C-nuts. You'd think that that is the worst. It, I think, I, I presume all women hate that word, don't they? And I don't think blokes like it very much. It's quite offensive, isn't it? It's not though. It, they've manipulated, everything's flipped 180 degrees and turned on its head. Uh, I'll tell you what this word means, and it took ages to get to this. Okay, th that word, spelt properly, get this. Uh, considered to be the most vile, obscene and vulgar swear word in the English language. The word canut, which we've got out of that. Um, means woman's vagina, doesn't it? Um, it says, an, um, as if that's not an indication why it's considered such, um, such a vile term in the, vi uh, in the vagina hating patriarchy run by men. It's a patriarch, that's why that's a term of um, abuse. Okay. The word itself was originally a term of respect and reverence for a powerful, spiritually enlightened woman. So all you ladies here are a big bunch of Canucks here today. <laughs> Men in the nicest way. You are. And for, so fellas are Canucks as well, I think. Uh, so Canuck. <laughs> Canuck the... I think I'm biggest Canuck here, aren't I? Um, so Canuck, said properly, derives from Kunda or Kunti. Um, the Oriental Great Goddess. Wow. I don't know how much of this is true, but it's interesting. She was the Great Yoni. Vagina of the universe. <laughs> well, my ex-missus, that vagina of the universe. Uh, yeah, so she was the great Yoni vagina of the universe, where all life came from, and to where all life returned for renewal. Uh, from the same name, the words country, sorry, country, kin, and kind come from. So, if anybody calls you cannot, they are giving you the greatest compliment. So I'll have to get rid of that now because that's not very good, is it? So, right, this is how it's supposed to work. And it don't, it's all in reverse, it's the reflection, it's all opposite. Okay. I'll give you a few more examples of this shite that we're having to go through. Well, we haven't got to go through it any longer because we're getting there. Um, we're getting there from people like Mark and other, res other researchers who are coming out with some great stuff. Um, well, I'll tell you what, why we, oh, this, oh, you'll like this. Some people have heard this, some um, part of Critical Mass Radio um, have heard this before. But just on the subject of words, I'll get off them in a bit. Uh, anybody who knows me, I'm a bit of a wordsmith. I like, um, I like flipping words around and finding different meanings and stuff. 
And somebody asked me to do it. I did it on my show, well, I think I've done it twice now, on my radio show. Somebody asked me to do it again. So for all you people who are still not convinced, and if you're new to this, don't worry about it, so let's take on board. Inter all law is interpretation, in fact, everything is interpretation of words. And like I said, they've, take your tackle for a minute, they've manipulated all the language. So for those who still aren't convinced that words mean something, uh, I'm a bit of a wordsmith, and I like flipping them around and doing anagrams. And I did some anagrams on my show, in fact, um, my mate Dave sent me a few of these. Get this, if you don't think anything's in words, you're going to like this. Okay, so what we do is, uh, I decided to do my own name, Rob Freeman. I thought I'll flip it round, see what I can make of it. Um, just before I tell you this, how your mind works, how your mind, how your mind works is, um, it sees a number, a colour, a symbol, or a word flip round. It sees it all the same. It has to, it has to, it has to uh, just flood it in like a sponge. It can't, otherwise you'd never be able to take enough information in. That's your subconscious mind. Uh, your subconscious mind, uh, your subconscious mind takes in 95% of everything and it sorts it out later so it has an effect on you. Your conscious mind only does about 5%, okay? So, a word spun round in an anagram. So for instance, Rob Freeman, an anagram of Rob Freeman is, no letters added, no letters taken away, is I'm born free. That's really simple. But your mind will see I'm born free as Rob Freeman, your subconscious mind. These people or whatever entities are running things know this. <coughs> I think, from what I've, I'm not sure of these figures, but um, your subconscious mind can process uh, four and a half billion bits of information a second. I don't know if bits is the right uh, measurement or whatever it is. Um, and I think it's, I think it's two, two million for your conscious mind and something like four and a half billion for your subconscious mind. It has to take it all in. That's why these people are using symbols, signs, Numbers, massive thing about numbers, colours, they all have an effect on our subconscious. So, okay, anagram of Rob Freeman is I'm born free. Okay, these are, some of these are rubbish. Astronomer, anagram, moon starer. Fair enough. No letters added, no letters taken away. The eyes is they see, that's pretty crap, isn't it? Um, Saville, as in that horrible um, evil ass, or as vile. Interesting, isn't it? And these all letters taken away. <laughs> Uh, that's thinking of on Ted Heath, the death, says it all. Horrible fat bastard. He was, sorry, but he was. He were though, weren't he? Um, agreement, enter game. Mm, that's interesting for law and commerce, isn't it? Anagram of agreement is enter game. I'm going to get off these words in a minute. Uh, let's have a look. I'll miss some of these off. Oh, this is nice. Uh, a decimal point. Anagram of a decimal point. I'm a dot in place. How's it work out like that? Somebody's manipulated this language. Okay, a couple more. Desperation. A rope ends it. The anagram of desperation is a rope ends it. Now, nothing's done by coincidence. This is by design. Um, I'll scrap some of these. You're going to love the last one. It's going to blow your mind. Okay, two more. My favourite one. Mother-in-law. Woman Hitler. Says it fucking all, doesn't it? <laughs> is it coincidence? I don't know. And get this one. My favourite one. Oh, it's crackers, isn't it? It's the type of thing I do in my fucking spare time, this. <laughs> Get ready for this one. Are ready? Princess Diana. The anagram for Princess Diana, not letters taken away, not letters added, is end is a car spin. Wow. Get a pen and paper. <laughs> Write down Princess Diana and figure it out. End is a car spin. So, what I'm trying to tell you is we've been tricked, manipulated and oppressed and enslaved by words. Somebody or something's put those words together for a reason, haven't they? I mean, what's the chat? Well, I wonder what, uh, if you put, a, you put a bet on uh, William Hill. Princess Diana, end is a car spin. What's the, what's the odds against that? That's unbelievable, isn't it? That's like an anagram of my name is a um, fat little dark skin bloke with a big nose, isn't it? It's, what's the chances of actually living what your anagram of your name is? Okay, so the, they're the words. Um, I don't look very organised here, do I? Because I'm not. I've had to scrap some of this because Mark's covered some of this stuff better than I could. So I've got rid of it. Okay, so carry on with the manipulation. Yeah? I'll get rid of that. Oh, this is interesting. You might like this one. Okay. You might not. This is, um, I don't know where I got this from, but this is interesting. This is happening, this is happening right now. Okay. Again, part of the manipulation. Um, this is the seven stage cycle played out for centuries and repeated over and over. Okay, the times we're living in now seem unique to us, obviously. Um, but this is a seven stage cycle that's played out over and over again. 
Again, it's the manipulation of whoever's controlling us, and we'll get nearer to that in a bit. Okay, this same cycle of seven stages goes over and repeats itself over and over again. Okay, stage one, good money. At first, the money is backed by gold and silver, sterling. Okay, we know that. See how many of these you can relate to? So number one, it starts off with good money backed by gold and silver, yeah? As sterling. Number two, social programs. Okay, this is the same stages that happen every single time. Social programs, the nation develops and takes on more economic burdens and adds more and more public work projects and social programs, okay. Number three, military spending. As the nation becomes more affluent, its political influence increases. So it increases its expenditure to fund a massive military, okay. This is what happened to, as far as we know, to the Roman Empire. This is they basically ran out of money uh, due to the many conflicts they had. China, huh? Pardon? It's happening in China. Is right? it right? It's, China? It's a system that's in place and it's for a reason. Yeah, China as well. Okay, so that's number three. Number four, war. The nation puts its exploding military expenditure to good use by engaging in war. So this sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay, there's only seven stages. Number five, fiat currency. To keep on funding the war, and there can be several conflicts happening at once, the nation steals the wealth of its people by replacing their money with a currency that, be, that can be created in unlimited quantities. This is fiat currency, simply meaning it's backed by nothing. Taxes are raised to pay back the loans obtained to help fund the war, excuse me, and also, and also to pay for the repairs after the war, after the conflicts, and it's the private banks that get their money back. Okay, so that's stage number five. You can see this happening over and over again. Two more stages left and this is where we're at now. This is the stage, in my opinion, where we're at. Stage number six, hyperinflation or inflation. We're just, we're just getting into hyperinflation. All done by design for centuries. Okay, get this. Wealth is transferred up to them, the leaders, whoever they are. Wealth is transferred up to them, not down to us. Um, it is caused by the expansion of fiat currency supply and is felt by the population as severe consumer price inflation. Okay, this is number six, hyperinflation, yeah? This triggers uh, a loss in faith in the currency. This is happening right now in Britain and America and elsewhere. So we're in hyperinflation. And then the last stage before it all implodes on itself. And then all they do is move on and do it somewhere else. Okay. So stage number seven, wealth transfer. Get this. See if this makes sense. Uh, when we reach stage seven, uh, which is where we're going to be there shortly, there's a mass movement away from currency and into precious metals and other tangible assets. How many people are buying gold? How many people are panicking? I mean, little stores on the street, everyone were buying gold, weren't they? Everyone still is. Um, uh, where were I? Uh, uh, there's a mass movement away from currency and into precious metals and other tangible assets that takes place. As the currency crumbles, massive wealth is transferred to those who had the foresight and insider information to place their money into the right asset class beforehand. Okay, the ones in the know, the ones in these secret groups, or whoever they are, are all putting the money into the right asset class at the right time while the rest of us are going to end up penniless. Um, we are currently in between stages six, hyperinflation, and stage seven, wealth transfer, and we are witnessing the biggest transfer of wealth in history, which will, will result in bankruptcy for each individual, leaving all but a select, select few in a state of uh, bankruptcy and total financial enslavement. And then, of course, what they do is they come up with a solution that they cause in the first place. So those seven cycles are what is happening over and over and over again. Um, and I put the ones that will, the ones that will come out rich in all of this are the ones who have orchestrated the collapse and the subsequent transfer of wealth and left the rest of us penniless. And that's what's happening right now. So we're in between now hyperinflation uh, and a massive, massive, massive. That's a massage, isn't it? A massive wealth transfer. I took, well, let me take this car off, by the way. It's got to me. Hang on, sorry. See my shirt? Who's in my shirt? My brother-in-law says, here Rob, have that, it's too big for me. He says, what is it? He says, oh, it's uh, indigenous writing, you know, from tribesmen. He says, what's it mean? He says, I don't know, you have to look it up. I thought, oh, it's nice, that look. It's kind of, oh, it's kind of tribal, isn't it? Ah, can, can you look it up on Google, eh? Right? Only turns out to be a Navajo woman, Indian woman's shopping list. <laughs> that's a loaf of bread. That's a big man. That's, that's Jack. That really is Jack. I've got jam on it. Yeah, so I mean, well, it's all I thought it was going to be something really spiritual and meaning. Right, so thanks, brother in law, for that. Okay. Uh, I've got Paul. How long before a break? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. No, I'm just saying how long. How long two, you... two minutes. If that's an hour, then. And then Ten. Yeah. Okay, but the deodorant. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't start out smelling like this this morning. Okay, I would have started off with this, but I think I dropped my papers on the train on here, so it all ended up back to front. Okay, this is a quote from Thomas Cox. I'm going on with this. Uh, this is reiterating a tiny little bit of what Mark just spoke about. Um, so we've got a sweat on. Thomas, Co Thomas Cox said, uh, There is far more to this world than is taught in our schools, shown in our media, or proclaimed by church and state. Most of mankind lives in a hypnotic trance taken to be reality, but what is instead a twisted simulacrum of reality, a collective dream. Get this, in which values are inverted, Lies are taken as truth and tyranny accepted as security. Um, people enjoy their ignorance and cling tightly to the misery that gives them identity. Wow. Great quote because it's all about what I said at the beginning is when it's a fear based system. Um, the last bit of that it said, um, let's get to the last bit. Value, values are inverted, lies are taken as truth and tyranny accepted as security. People enjoy their ignorance and cling tightly to the misery that gives them identity. And that's what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. The way to get rid of fear is to know, know, define yourself, know thyself. When you start to know yourself, which hopefully we're going to get to in the second half, the fear-based system will not affect you. All right, you might not be totally immune from it, but once you recognise the fear, for, well, I'm holding that like that. I don't know why I'm, why I'm doing that. Um, once you realise that is a fear-based system, and when you recognise fear for what it is and identify just who and what you are, all these symbols, all the horrible shit they're doing, um, chem chemtrails, the shit in the water, the vaccinations, all the... Uh, it, it, this is a war for your mind, pure and simple, it's a war for our mind, yes. that's it. Yes. All this shit that they're doing against us, when you can, when we will do this later on, and this is what I want to celebrate for this year, the second half of this, I want you, well I don't want you to do anything, but hopefully you will, same as I've done over these last few years, is try and look at yourself and look at fear and see what fear is. Fear is nothing but a choice, that's all it is. And when you identify yourself and recognise what fear is, it doesn't matter what words they're using, what symbols, what colours, what, I don't give a shite. Because when you know who you are and you act in a place of honour, this shit's going to come down simply by doing that, simply by recognising who you are. Yeah, it's like a... Flipping vicar, aren't it? Yeah? Uh, I'll give another quote here. Uh, Every man shares the responsibility and the guilt of society to which he belongs, okay? It's been said a few times, um, but things that are happening out there, you keep saying it's them and us, them and us. But some, whatever's happening out there, it, to a certain extent, is happening in here. It, it, it's a reflection, they call it a love reflection, of some sort of turmoil or something that's happening within us. And it's it's because it's fear based inside us and like I said once we not let go of fear because it's there to play a part but once we recognize what fear is and identify ourselves whatever is going on in here is being projected out there and like I said it's by consent they're tricking us into it and once we get this right inside we'll be getting that right out there as well but that's not to say we just do ourselves first and wait we do the whole thing together yeah okay so I'll read you a couple more quotes um, <coughs> I'm making sure. We're going to have a break in about five minutes. A man will do. Who is this? Oh, Carl Jung. A man will do anything, no matter how abs how absurd, not to have to face his own soul. Okay, because his own self. Um, and that's true. You've got to look within. Okay. Uh, let's miss that one off. That was crap. Okay. We don't re we don't receive wisdom. We must discover it for ourselves after a journey that no one can take for us or spare us. That one, Marcel Proust, an author. Uh, Max Egan, anybody like Max Egan? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, simple, look into your heart and then look, look into the heart of another. What you will find is yourself. The connection again, we're all one, aren't we? Um, Thomas Sars, I can't, I can't pronounce that, he's a psychologist. The self is not something one finds, but something one creates. Mm, I like it. Um, Couple more, we'll have a break. Marcel Pano, whoever that was, I think he was an author, I'm not sure. He says, the reason people find it so hard to be happy is they always see the past better than it was. True. The present worse than it is. Very true. Uh, and the future less resolved than it will be. Okay, very, 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 very interesting. 
Go for more. Dad, get some milk. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was my kid this morning, so I'm not screaming. Right? I told him not to piss about me, my fault. Eh? I'm only 13, he's about that big, I can't hit him anymore. Right? What, that way? Yeah, Dad. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, Dad, get some milk. Um, <laughs> spelled milk wrong. Uh, this one, this is a good one. Uh, where the hell is my underwear, Ellen Keller? No, sorry. That, was, that weren't very nice, was it? No. I've got sidetracked because I got lost. I thought I were, impro I were improvising, sorry. <laughs> Where the hell is my underwear? Can you edit that bit out, please? No. 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 That was rubbish, That was rubbish. Helen Keller, I'll make up for this. Uh, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. It didn't have the same effect after that underwear sketch, did it? Um, it didn't have really. I took the edge off that, didn't I? Uh, follow your bliss and the universe will open doors when there were... Oh, <laughs> I've wrote it really slow so I'm reading it slow. Right, start again. Follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where there were only walls. Joseph Campbell. Okay, one more and we'll get a drink. Um, piss that one off, piss that one off. Ooh, I like this one. Arthur Young. Great shot on here. Um, I like this one. I don't believe in God but I do believe in some sort of creator. Creator. Oh, I've rubbed it off. Uh, God sleeps in the minerals. Awakens in plants, walks in animals, and thinks in man. Mm. Nice one. And then the very last one. Oh, brilliant this one. This is a uh, fantastic artist, but crap childminder. Michael Jackson. <laughs> uh, I know, I'm rubbish, really. <laughs> He's, look at it, very profound from him. He probably went, at the same time, but... Let, let us dream of tomorrow where, um, I'll start again, let us dream of tomorrow where, where we can truly love from the soul and know love as the ultimate truth at the heart of all creation. Michael Jackson. Right, we'll have a break. Um, I'll try and get into some sort of order. Cheers for that. Right, isn't it? Really? It's spooky, that. Right there, volume just went then. We'll do that in a bit. We'll do, we'll do karaoke in a bit. Hang on, slap the water. Oh, thanks, Paul. Yeah. yeah, okay, so um, second half. Excuse me. <coughs> There's a lot. Oh, I've got too much, too much shite. I can't get through all this. Um, okay. What we'll do is uh, the second half is all about um, what we can do. Um, and obviously, I'm not telling anybody what to do or advising anybody. It's just what what my research has uh, led me to uh, to see these these entities. I don't, I don't know what to call them. Um, criminal class. I just call them criminal class. I don't know whether they are. Human in the, oh, I've dropped some paper, could be 20 quid now. Bollocks, raffle tickets. <laughs> um, I thought we were in then. I don't know whether these entities are human, I don't know if they're off world, I don't know what they are. All I know is that this system of control and oppression is very, very, very well thought out. I think it's too much for a human mind or human design. Um, I don't know, time will tell. Um, so I hinted it was about fear, fear based control basically. And so what what I do personally and what we can all do by changing our perception of fear and everything else and like I said identifying uh, just who and what we think we are or what we know we are rather than think okay so um, I'm going to have to miss some of this off anybody who's interested in I'll tell you, I'll, what I'll do is before I just get into that I'll give you a couple of references to have a look at see you think if anybody's interested in the law stuff thanks mate anybody interested in the law um, and don't forget the law is the the law of money, uh, it, the law stuff is the biggest oppression of all. That's the way uh, the spells they use. It's very, very deep. I'm going to go into this. Basically, I don't know how many people um, know me, but I've been to court many times. I've never been taken to court. I've gone to court to try and learn what to do. Uh, and the law stuff is really, really important because, as we know, legislation is what... what We've been oppressed by legislation, which is really consent. That's the consent I was telling you about, which I'll come to, like I said, later. Um, when you know the legal system, the legal system is basically designed for the criminals to hide behind and to ever increase legislation to make us all lawbreakers so that every single freedom right we've got is, is eroded and taken away so we're left with nothing. It's soon going to be illegal to, um, to fart, to pick your nose. I mean, smoking, you have to smoke under your quilt at night time with a torch eventually. They make everything illegal basically. And I've covered this many times before. There is a way of living like I do, which is 
as unlegal as possible. I don't live illegal, I'm not, it's not illegal because that's using their words and terminology, but there is a way of, uh, of living unlegal. So I kind of side, sidestep the old legal system. Um, and a man cannot make another, a law for another man. That sequence I had there from create a man, government, corporation, blah, blah, blah. Um, a government or another man can't make a law. All they can do is write policy uh, and try and enforce it or treat you into consent. So that's at the back of the whole thing. But what I was going to say is that every court is really a church. This is, I've read this stuff, I've studied it. Uh, and this is the stuff from my own experience. There's a chap sat at the back now who needs to talk, needs to help me. He's got about a thousand times more information than I could ever come up with. And I've done it the other way by experiencing it. And he's done it purely from hard work and research. And what we're saying is, a court is a church, okay? The reason we can't win in court is because we are all sinners. Now this is contrived, this is manipulated. This is, we've never rebutted it because we don't know. The words again we're using, we're tripping ourselves up. Um, I've been arrested 12 times now, and I've never committed a crime. A crime is causing harm to someone. Um, I've never committed harm to anyone, but I've been arrested 12 times for not giving details and various other things. And the first thing they say to it, as soon as they arrest me, you have the right to remain silent. Then what do they do? They ask me a lot of questions. I think, hang on a fucking minute, you're just talking about the right to remain silent. Anything you say might be used against you, so why the hell would I speak? And what we've realised is that when you speak is what incriminates you. Because the whole system is that reflection, it's 180 degrees twisted round. So that you can't possibly um, get any sort of justice. Because the whole system is designed to make us criminals and for the real criminals to hide behind the corporation and the insurance. So come on, sorry, sure now, that's not what we want to talk about. But the church, a church, not our, not our church, a constructed... Um, a constructed, constructed organisation or corporation using um, using religious using religion, sorry, core belief. We we've been installed with core belief systems. We believe things, and they're instilled from when we're little kids. It starts, as we know, um, seems to be drifting off all sorts, you know. Um, but these core belief systems are what have helped to to enslavers basically and to oppressors and we don't know any better as I like I say using the words. So all, if you stop, I mean I can't do it now, I'm gonna have to do another talk, full talk on this. All courts are churches. And when you realise that it's the high priest that you're going to see and you were all born according to them with original <coughs> sin original sin. So that means you can never win in court because you're a sinner. And all a solicitor does, what's a solicitor? Um, prostitutes get in trouble for soliciting don't we? And they're the same. Uh, all they do is they sell you out. We know they swore allegiance to something called the bar, okay? Uh, and all they do is sell you out and cut you a deal. So because you're a sinner, you get um, 20 Hail Marys to say instead of 40 Hail Marys. The solicitor's first allegiance is to the bar, excuse me. <coughs> Second allegiance is to the queen, and this third allegiance is to the client, which is us. So we come third on list. So the whole law is what um, the government's put the legislation in place, thus oppressing us. So I'm going to talk about that another time, but just bear in mind that all courts are basically churches. I'll, I'll do a talk on that. Okay, so if you want to know about the law, have a look at, has anybody heard of Frederick Bastiat? Frenchman, Bastiat, great stuff. If anybody is interested in law, um, a political econom eco economist, economist, I can't say that, economist. Okay, uh, he lived from 1801 to 1850. Frederick Bastiat, fantastic stuff, easy to understand as well. Uh, he wrote two books, one called The Law, and I think the other was called uh, That Which Is Seen and Unseen. Brilliant stuff. I'll just give you a couple of quotes from Frederick Bastiat. Um, this is what we tell people, these people that have perceived authority over us, that are oppressing us, judges, politicians, courts, whoever they are. Um, a quote from Bastiat here says, if you wish to provide an office, then prove its utility. Show its equal exchange of value. Um, to what it costs the citizen. In other words, these will be run by corporations and all they ever talk about is the price of everything. But they never fucking talk about the value of anything, do they? So again, it's manufactured. Price is irrelevant. It's all about exchange of value. And this is what I'm coming to towards the end. We're not there yet, man. That's what I'll do towards the end. Uh, another quote from him, and then I'll move on. To take by violence is not to produce, but to destroy. Okay? If you take anything by violence, you're destroying it. Um, and my favourite quote of his, 
and this is what we've got to think. If you're new to this, it might be a bit overwhelming, especially Mark's talk, overwhelming for us all. Uh, and even if you're not new to this, it can still be overwhelming. Uh, a great quote here, a false principle never has been and never will be carried out to the end. And that's what they they are running on, false principles. It's all fiction, it's all lies, um, and they will not get to their end game. The more of us that are awakening, we've got to see the whole thing. I got, I've, I've got people who are just doing the law stuff and other people are trying to do the chemtrail stuff and it's all great, it's great to do your little bits, but what we've got to see today and what wants to see is the connection of the whole thing and it is all connected. Okay, so I'll get rid of that. Um, church and state were being controlled by, I'm going to, I'm not going to go into great detail these, but um, we're being controlled by church and state, okay? Uh, and, and I'm sure Mark knows about this, but I've spoke to, um, I did an interview with Santos Bernacci for Critical Mass Radio, and I mentioned this, and I didn't really know what I was talking about, which is surprised, and I know Mark, I've heard you talk about this. I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but it's called the Order um, of Mel... It's spelled Melchizedek. How do you pronounce that, Mark? Uh, uh, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Okay, who said that? Thanks, it could, it could be whatever you mean. Okay, so the Order of Melchizedek. Um, for me, uh, Melchizedek was uh, supposedly a real king, uh, lived during the time of Abraham, 2000 years BC. Um, Melchizedek, I can't say that, I'll call him Melchizedek because he's my mate. Uh, Melchizedek, even though that's not his name, um, was, see if I can uh, just read you a quick one here. This is interesting, this. Uh, he was a righteous and godly leader over a very special place of real estate, the ancient city of Salem, later to be called Jerusalem. Anyone remember Salem's law? Yeah. What I mean in that as well. Um, get this, he presided over both the religion and the politics of his city. Um, the significant thing about Melchizedek is, I don't know why I did that with my legs, then I've got cramped. Um, the significant thing about Mel Melchizedek, whatever his name is, was not only the place of his rule and ministry, which was over the holy place, but, the, he, the, but that he operated in two offices as both priest and king. And for me, that's the origins of church and state. Um, the Jesus myth that's the allegory, everything's allegory and metaphor. The Jesus myth that we've been given is really, as far as I can see, allegory for um, astrological men of the sun. But from my research, and there's many people, Mark himself, I think, better than me, there was uh, an historical figure called Jesus, and I think it was either um, his family line went back to Melchizedek's line, maybe the pharaohs, but I'm sure Mark... Um, King of Edessa, Ralph, Ralph Ellis's book, identified and proven as the King of Edessa. Was Fantastic. But it's not the story... But it goes back to that, yeah. Yeah, and that's not the story that they give us through the uh, New Testament, is it? Yeah, so that's, for me, is the origins of church and state. Okay, anybody know about... I'll skip through these, because i get on to some good stuff. Anybody heard of John D? Dr. John D? Yeah, um, have a look at that, research that, John D, just type in John D, interesting stuff. Um, I'm not really going to go on about this, but he learnt a lot about the dark side. Uh, well, let's have a look. Was it Elizabethan times this is? I, anybody, um, try and look at Michael Tessarion, because he's got a great, I don't know if it's theory or he's got the evidence to suggest that John D, okay, in Elizabethan times, may have been one of the first people to bring some, whether you believe in this stuff or whatever, some dark entities into this reality. And that's what he was... Um, he talks a lot about angels and demons and stuff. And he had, a, he had a, an assistant called Edward Kelly. Now, I'll see if I can just... I'm going to read you this out, you see, so I'll just skip most of it. What we think is, and I, Michael Tassarin goes into great deals, so get it up on YouTube, that using the black, black magic and black arts that they actually drew um, dark entities into this realm that are still here now. That's according to Michael Tessarion. So check out John D. Uh, I'll miss that off. Oh, Paul sent me something about the Pope's ring, but I ain't got time to do it now. It's all about kissing the Pope's ring. Now, it says here, kissing the Pope's ring, but I ain't got time to do it now. It's actually a ring he wears on his finger, but we're all supposed to bow down and kiss the Pope's ring, which... Uh, I mean, if I can clean my teeth after, I don't mind, but I'll pass it out. Anyway, I can't do that now, so thanks, Paul, for that. Uh, another character. Has anybody heard of Count St. Germain? We don't know, yeah? We don't know whether he's mythical or whether he's real. Supposedly real. 
I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit back about this chat. Um, Count St. Germain, okay, is it possible that a man can achieve immortality to live forever? Um, that's a sorting claim of a historical figure, whether he was or not, I don't know, known as Count St. Germain. I'm not pronouncing it right, but Count St. Germain. Records date his birth to the late 1600s, although some believe that his longevity reaches back to the time of Christ. He has appeared many times throughout history. This is a chap who apparently, we don't know if it's right or not, could be bullshit, might not be, I don't know. He keeps appearing in different, different times. His latest one was the 70s, apparently, but he can be traced back to Christ through the Middle Ages. Um, he's appeared many times throughout history, even as recently as the 1970s, um, always appearing to be about 45 years old. Uh, he, was known by many, uh, he was known by many of the most famous figures of European history, including Casanova, Madame de Pompadour, Voltaire, King Louis the Fifteenth, Catherine the Great, Anton Mesmer, and others. So they've all documented that they've known this chap called Count Saint Germain. Okay, uh, see if I can miss this. Right, he's supposed to have been born in 1960. Okay, I'm going to skip some of this out. Okay, the Secret of Kings asserts that he was born the son of Francis Rakos II, Prince of Transylvania, in 1690. Okay, so supposedly the um, Son of the Prince of Transylvania. Okay. Other accounts say he was alive at the time of Jesus, when Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, Missed that bit off. The reason I'm with these gaps is I'm trying to get through it. Okay. He first came into prominence in 17, around 1742 in Europe. He spent five years with the Shah of, in the Shah of Persia's court. This has all been documented. Uh, where he learned the jeweler's craft. This, that, this, that, this, that. The point I'm getting to is he had a knowledge of science, history, musical ability. Um, he's easy charm and quick wit. Um, he spoke many languages fluently, including French, German, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and English. Very clever clogs, isn't he? Was further uh, Chinese, Latin, Arabic, Greek, and Sanskrit. Okay, he could speak all these languages. Okay. Uh, he met a lady when, he met, when she met him a second time. Um, 45 years later, or 50 years later, she worked out that he should have been 100 years old, and he still appeared to be 45 years old. So what I'm basically saying is this chap never aged, he was massively gifted in languages, arts, music, and uh, all that sort of stuff. A painter, he could do all sorts, play violin, real clever clogs. Um, apparently he, he could do alchemy. Okay, and again, um, this chap, um, supposed to turn base metals into gold. So we had all these talents, but the point is, um, and this is through different ages, centuries apart, wherever he, tra um, wherever he traveled, he set up an elaborate laboratory, presumably for, presumably for his alchemy, alchemy work. He seemed to be a man of great wealth, but was never known to have any bank accounts. Um, he could transmute base metals into gold. Uh, I missed that bit off. He prefer oh I like this one. He prescribed recipes for the removal of facial wrinkles and for dying hair. Go on, son. He loved jewels. Uh, much of his clothing, including his shoes, were studded with them. He had a perfect technique for painting jewels. Uh, he claimed to be able to fuse several small diamonds into larger ones. Wow, no one is rich. Uh, missed that one off. He has been linked to several secret societies, including the Rosicrucians, Freemasons. Society of Asiatic Brothers, the Knights of Light, the Illuminati, uh, and Order of the Templars. It goes on and on. Basically, this chap was supposed to be immortal. Uh, and again, somebody claiming to be him was in 1972. But have a look at it, um, Count St. Germain. So this okay. is what I've realised, and I've been doing the low commerce stuff. I'll put a stick it on that one. Remember all that singer used to do that? I can remember him in the 70s. Who said that? Who said I'll be Stardust then? That's what you mean, you can remember him. He used to have one glove underneath. I think he used to have one glove before Michael Jackson. What am I still doing it for? Oh, yeah, so uh, this is what I come up with. All, all reality is consciousness. So, like I said, I was doing this stuff, uh, reading some books in the 70s, or like a tiny kid. Um, I think the first books I read were about Eric Von Daniken. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. And it were about pyramid building and artifacts and stuff like that. And I sort of progressed through years studying all this stuff. And then, sort of six years ago, I got into this law and commerce stuff. But I've always kept this sort of stuff up. Uh, and even before I read my first David Icke book, probably 1994, I think, the first book of his, might have been earlier, 
I already knew a lot of this stuff, or felt a lot of this stuff. Um, and this is what I'm coming to for what we can do against this oppressive system. Uh, and what I realise is that everything is um, a wave of energy, or, or even a sound wave. Um, and I learned this a long, long time ago. Look at the word uh, universe. Uni, uh, same as mono, same as mon. Uni means one. Uh, it's a verse. It's, it's a song. It's a sound wave from the universe. Um, that's why you have organs. That's why you've got organs in your body. Because that energy, um, you've got your organs that resonate with that energy. I do a type of chanting. Um, I was telling somebody earlier on, I got arrested for three days and I thought, oh, oh, for nothing. I sat on my bed like that and I thought, what can I do to get on their nerves because they bug me like. And I sat on my bed cross eyed just chanting. Like, mm. If you get home and done, so you're all right. I went, yeah. And then I go back out and I just went, mm. But I chanted for three days and didn't eat anything, didn't drink any water. But I felt fantastic when I come out. It's one of the greatest, it's one of the greatest things you can do. Uh, and the reason chanting works, a lot of monks do it, but a lot of these monks, um, they have a different chant for every organ of the body. So we're back to a vibration, a sound vibration, and a, it's harmonic resonance, basically. Um, there's a lot of people doing um, sound therapy, using vibrational sound to heal, heal you in certain areas, it's something you can be looking at. These are all, this is all stuff, by the way, what I'm coming to towards the end is um, the fear-based system that whoever's created it has got it in place, the fear-based system, I can talk to you while I get an ask, bye bye. Um, the fear-based system that they've created instantly shuts down your immune system. Yeah, it puts you in a, uh, a state of fight or flight. As soon as you're in a state of um, fight, your immune system is shot instantly in order to cope with an, an immediate danger. And that's what they keep us in on the edge all the time. And so all this shit that I was saying, all the chemicals, toxins, poisons, all this crap, will only have an effect on us when our immune system is not working at its optimum. Our immune system, as far as I've studied, uh, I don't like using that word, I have to mark it, as far as I've researched, is absolutely perfect. Uh, and we know the word disease, that's why you get a disease. It's when it, certain areas of your body are not resonating to its natural frequency. Okay, excuse me. <coughs> when you're in a state of fear like they try and keep us in, your immune system is totally shot and that's why we get ill. It's all down to this stress of fear. I'll go into what fear, what I think fear is. Okay, so I'll put this together. Uh, I don't know how long ago this was. Um, I did it on a radio show not long ago. I don't know how much of this is factually correct, but it makes sense to me. Okay, I put all, real, all reality is consciousness. Uh, we are source energy and eternal beings. We're an expression of the universe becoming conscious and expressing itself. Okay. We are all made of the same stuff as each other uh, and the same as everything else. That table, you, me, my dog at home, the bottle of milk, we're all made of the same stuff, aren't we? Uh, and everything else in the universe. Okay, I'm going to miss that bit off. Okay, so even mainstream science now, I don't know how factual this is, but tells us that the smallest thing that can be we, we can be broke, anything can be broken down into uh, is an atom. That's what we've been told. I don't know how true it is. Um, but there's a problem with atoms because even mainstream science is saying now, that an atom is 99.999% empty. So the smallest component, we're all made of the same stuff, smallest component is an atom, and yet an atom is 99.999% empty space. Hmm, interesting. So everything is 99.999% empty space, including us. Interesting. And then I came across something, has anybody heard of the measurement problem regarding atoms? Has anybody heard of this? Mass. Pardon? Mass. Yeah, it's, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's called the measurement problem. Yeah, and it says, uh, here's the thing with atoms. Atoms cause a bit of a problem. Now, they're telling us that everything can be broken down to its smallest uh, component as an atom. But there's a bit of a problem with atoms. Okay, so if you want to make some quantum physicist shit himself, just mention the measurement problem to him because he can't answer it. And this is really interesting. And this is all about, again, consciousness and energy. Okay, the problem, I'll tell you what the measurement problem is. It's uh, an atom only, only appears in a particular place if you measure it, okay? Uh, in other words, an atom spread out all over the place until a conscious observer decides to look at it. So when you start looking at an atom and actually observing it and measuring it, measuring it, it behaves completely different to when it's unobserved. Okay, it's going somewhere this. So atoms kind of uh, contradict themselves. An atom can behave, it behaves both like a particle uh, and, and a wave. 
So what I'm trying to say is, when it's not being observed, let me get this. Okay, when you are not looking at an atom, it behaves like a spread out wave. Okay, but when you look at it to see where it is, it behaves like a particle. Hmm, what does that mean? See, see if it's interesting. Okay, all matter unobserved. So if you're not looking at it, it moves and vibrates in waves. Yeah. If you're not observing it. Uh, it's a good point, I thought that. I thought, well, if you're not observing it, how do you know? And it's some, it's, it's, it's some um, measuring device that they can measure it by not... It's when it's a conscious observer. Okay. When it's been, I know, I thought that. I thought, well, how do they know if it, how it reacts if it's unobserved, if they're not looking at it? It's when it's been consciously observed, yeah? It is going somewhere. There's a comparison. Imagine that, you're play, imagine that you're playing music, right? So you play music. Um, you need silence in between that music to be able to cut it to make a beat. Okay, otherwise it'd be just concert music, wouldn't it? So to make a beat, you've got to have silence in between. Okay, that makes a bars, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah, so in the same way, if you're creating reality, you need space in between. It's similar, I don't know if you can um, actually appreciate this, but the space in between the music is what creates the bars, and the space in between reality... If you're making reality, you need space to define the reality in between. Otherwise, it's just a constant. It's got to have a break in between. I'm not explaining that very well. See if I can carry on. Um, reality, therefore, is the various divisions of space, okay, in a fractal structured vacuum. Now, that sounds like a golf ball. I'll explain it to you. So, what we're saying is reality, that we think is reality, reality, therefore, is the various divisions of space in a fractal structured vacuum. Okay, it sounds confusing. See if I can break it down. Well, what, what's a vacuum? Why a vacuum? Okay, we've already said a vacuum, definition of a vacuum is not nothingness. Uh, a vacuum is def defined as a space entirely free from matter. Okay. Just because it's free from matter doesn't mean that there's nothing there. Okay, no thing is something. Okay, I'm not doing it very well here, but it will, it will make sense. Okay, we've already ascertained that uh, an atom is 99.9% .9 empty space, haven't we? Okay, when something's fractal, I'm, I'm trying to skip it, you see. When something's fractal, the tiniest piece of it is the same as the whole thing, like a hologram, isn't it? Yeah? The stuff in the vacuum is not empty just because it contains no matter. The vacuum itself is a conduit, a channel of conveyance, okay? So the vacuum itself is transferring to conveyance of energy. I don't even know if that makes sense. Uh, a channel of conveyance of, of what's in the space, and the thing in it is called consciousness. Okay, I made the right bollocks now, what I'm trying to say is, the empty space that they're saying is not empty just because it's got no matter. What it is, is it's a channel of conveyance of energy, and that energy is consciousness. Uh, I didn't explain that very well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read you Max Planck. Anybody heard of Max Planck? I'm in the right box here, didn't I? The reason why I do it on my radio show. Um, Max Planck. Anybody heard of Max Planck? Yeah, Yeah, okay. Max Planck wrote in 1944. Okay, he explains a lot better than I do. Crap at it, aren't I? Don't know. In 1944, Max Planck called this stuff in the so-called vacuum, and thus everywhere else, he called it the Matrix, which is where they got the idea from the film. So what we're talking about is, up in space, where they say there's nothingness, uh, in between the atoms, remember what I said about the atoms, 99.9% .9 empty space? Well, it's empty space, <coughs> but it is the Matrix, it's consciousness, that's what's in the empty space. Okay? Does that make sense? It doesn't really, does it? Does it make sense? Anybody understand that at all? It makes perfect sense to me. Okay. It's Andrew Einstein, but it's come out shite, hasn't it? Okay, Max Planck in 1944 called this stuff in the so-called vacuum. So it's everywhere, because an atom is 99.9% empty. He called it the matrix. He called it a conscious and intelligent mind. He said this mind is the matrix of all matter. Um, thus, the space inside a vacuum, which is everywhere, because the vacuum is everywhere, because atoms are 99.9% .9 empty. The space inside a vacuum, which is everywhere, is consciousness, and we are made up of that stuff. So what I'm trying to say is, if everything's made up of atoms, and, and atoms are almost completely empty, something's in there. What I mean by empty is there's no matter, but inside there is an energy called consciousness. Okay, that's what we're made up of. Pardon? Intelligence. Exactly, intelligent, conscious mind. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is the empty space, um, they tell us that we live in a material world, that everything's about matter, the ones that are controlling stuff. And obviously it's not about matter, because everything's made up, of atom, made up of atoms. And the empty space in between is conscious, intelligent energy. 
and that's what we're made up of, and that's what everything's made up of. So the point I'm trying to get to is we are all connected. Right, see if I can make a bolt to this one as well. Right, okay, um, what I wanted to talk about is uh, the great talk put uh, uh, sent hands by, I think I pronounce is it Abdun Noor you pronounce it? Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah, about the few, we live in, uh, the, the system in place is a feudal, feudalistic Alloy system. Alloy Dullum feudal. Pardon? Alloy Dullum feudal. Yeah, about feudalist system, uh, we are nothing basically, it's a feudal system. Try and get it, it's on, it's on YouTube, and it, uh, it's on, uh, has New Horizons got a website run? Yeah, so get on to New Horizons, have a look at this talk, fantastic. Uh, and it's interesting stuff because he talks about psychopaths. Um, and in my opinion, it's something of a psychopathic nature that is what's controlling things. Um, and it's good because he confirmed a lot of stuff, um, Rob, that I've been looking at. Is that the ones in control again, I'm getting back to this fear thing now, and it's all married in with um, conscious energy and vibrational stuff. Um, what Abdul Noor said, and I totally agree with, is that psychopathic entities are in control of things. And I started looking at um, anything that has a hierarchy. Now, corporations have a hierarchy, don't they? Uh, the religious institution, the Vatican or whatever, all religious institutions have a hierarchy. And what I've realised, and that talk really confirmed it for me, is that for something to have hierarchy, it has, it has to be psych psychopathic in nature. There's no other way for anything to be structured in a, hi in a hierarchy other than to be psychopathic in nature. Uh, there's a film called The Corporation, has anybody seen that? Um, some psychologist or whatever put all the traits of a corporation into a computer as if it was a living being and it turned out it became a psychopath, the corporation was a psychopath. If it had been a living, breathing human being it would have been um, diagnosed as a psychopath. Yeah. Um, it's been estimated psychopaths make up 4% of the population. I don't know how true that is. I think there's more than that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so for something to have a hierarchy in its structure, it has to be psychopathic in nature. Um, briefly, psychopaths have tendency, we know they have zero empathy or whatever, um, zero empathy. They, they judge, they, um, they, they have difficulty putting themselves in somebody else's position. If Paul falls over, I'll go and help him. They have a job doing that. They are the centre of their own universe. Um, so by its very nature, psychopathy um, follows a hi hierarchical structure, if you see what I'm saying. So if you look at, we are being run by corporations, but we, run, we are being run by hierarchical structures, courts, police, government, everything is run uh, as an hierarchy, so everything is psychopathic. Okay. Um, and so getting back to this fear stuff I wanted to talk to you about. <coughs> the reason a hierarchy works is that one entity is better in some way than another entity. Who's, but you have the chance through a hierarchical system um, to improve and move up a level. The very, the very fact that you've got levels um, means it's hierarchical, which means that it has to have <coughs> an element of psychopathy about it. What you've got to do is to move up to the next level, you've got to shit all over the level below you to move up to the next level. And so this is how we've been taught. If you look at, there's a hierarchy in school. Um, from, from when we're little, we get to, up to school, there's a hierarchy in school. Try and name any institution or any organisation that isn't or doesn't run on a hierarchy, there isn't one. So by its very nature, it all has an element of um, psychopathy about it. So. Getting back to when I said about fear, recognising what fear is, fear is a choice. I used to think it was an emotion. I used to think, reading the early David Icke books, that um, you had a choice. Um, that I used to say that everything was an extension of love or fear. Okay, when you're feeling um, agitated, angry, upset, or vindictive, or bitter, or anything, it's an extension of fear. Um, when you feel happy, content, or whatever, it's an extension of love. But what I've realised is um, that it's not about love and fear. Love is love, unconditional love. If you are capable of showing love uh, in any form, um, that's it, that love is on its own. Fear is a choice. It's not an equivalent, it's not the opposite of love. Fear is another choice. Um, the only reason we, are, we, su we suffer in this system is that um, everything is fear-based. 
but because we don't understand what fear is really, we, we've not traced it back far enough because we haven't recognised ourselves. So the point I'm trying to get to now is, is what are we? What are, are you? Uh, what do, we've got to define yourself. We all know we've been given a corporate title name. That's how they define us. Uh, they can't do anything to us, so they act on the corporation. But it's not about letting anybody else have authority over you. Remember what I said about not hurting anyone, not causing harm to anyone. If you don't cause harm to anyone, there's no new hierarchy. You are the highest, the highest power in this universe, equally between us, because we're all the same. So that gets rid of hierarchy and psychopathy. If you recognise that you are the highest power, and as long as you don't cause anybody else to suffer, any living soul, including animals, including trees, including each other, um, if you don't cause harm, then you are standing as sovereign as your highest power. You are an exact replica of the creator, of all creation. Okay? What these people want to do, these psychos, is to flip it round. They want to take us out of that. Now, what do we do? We, we are looking for truth. Uh, it's called a, I don't like calling it truth moment. It's called a truth moment, isn't it? Uh, we're looking for truth, and what do we do? We stand as sovereigns in light, don't we? But all these psychos that have twisted it around are working in the shadows. They don't, they call, we, we know about the Illuminati and Lucifer the light bearer, and there's all these different um, metaphors and allegories. Um, but in the end, if you and me and, and us stand in, um, is standing on it, it's all about honour and dishonour. Stand in honour and stand in truth and stand in lie. What they want us to do is they want us to turn our backs to the lie um, and cause a shadow and they want to work in shadows. And we'll face the lie because truth is lie. Now, everybody's truth might be slightly different. But the truth is, for everybody, is, is all about honour. And like I said, what are we here for? Are you, um, are you Mr. Mr. Johnson Plummer? If, when, when, if you do get arrested by a copper or somebody speaks to you and say, oh, what, what's your name? John, John what? Uh, John Smith. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a butcher. Well, we're defining ourselves. We're limiting ourselves. Well, this is what I'm trying to say. Now, we're start, if you, if you, it's up to us to define ourselves. Uh, he's not John Smith Butcher. Um, he's not... Well, 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 I'm 46 years old, I'm male. That's not you either, is it? Um, anything that you did in your past, that how many times you had you did good things and shit things, how many times you popped up and made a cock up of things, that's not you either, is it? So once we, what we're trying to do is, um, by negation, we're trying to find out just who and what we are. So by getting rid of the things that we know we're not, so we know we're not that. Male or female is irrelevant, that's not who you are. Okay, so... No titles, no names, I'm this physical body. But hang on a minute, I'm not even this physical body, am I? This is just a vehicle, isn't it? Um, there's a big difference between when someone's asleep and someone's dead. If you saw two people next to each other, one asleep and one dead, what's the difference? Well, there's an energy life force missing from one, isn't there? So we're not even this body, are we? So what I'm trying to get to is, once you can define who and what you are, who and what we are, then this thing about fear makes a whole it has a different perspective altogether. It has no effect whatsoever. Um, we inhabit this body, um, and for years and years we thought that were us. Now, hang on a minute, it's not us, is it? If we're all made of the same stuff, and I went on and I made a cock up about that energy thing, with atoms and stuff, but the energy that's flowing through through the universe, through plan all the planets, through us, uh, I, learned, I learned from an early age everything's about electricity, water and minerals. That's what the universe, that's what we run on. Electricity, water and minerals. Electric universe that Mark mentioned earlier is, in my opinion, is spot on. So we're basically some form of life force or energy inhabiting this, um, this body to uh, experience something in this reality. That's it. So if anything's made of energy, it has to go back to source. So what I'm saying is, you're not your body, you're not your name, you're not what you did, and you're not being defined by somebody else. Death, what's death? Okay. <coughs> my, ooh, my experience of death I is... I can't hear you. Pardon? I can't hear you. Can't you? said death, what's death? My experience of death um, is a transference of energy. Um, so you can't ever die. I know you can't die. Um, all it is is transfer of, of transfer of energy from this 
plane or dimension to somewhere else. So, what is it to be scared of? Okay, what is there actually to be scared of? Um, not having any money. Well, that's the big one, isn't it? Not having any money, but um, you won't starve to death. I, um, I know people, in fact, I've met someone. There's thousands of people in the world called um, breatharians. They don't eat anything. They don't, there's a bloke on YouTube who's not ate for 70 years. Yeah, 95% uh, of your energy comes from your breathing, not from food. In fact, food takes away energy. Everything's been turned around on its arse. Everything you've ever been told is a lie. Okay, you're not going to starve to death. Breatharians don't eat, he's not eat for 70 years. They don't even drink water. You don't even need to drink water. Um, what I'm saying to you is, there's nothing, there's nothing that can happen to you in this realm that you didn't you already know were going to happen, okay? Maybe before you even came here. There's nothing to be scared of whatsoever. What, what can happen? Um, police have locked me up. They locked me up for two or three days. Well, so what? Who cares? Who gives a shit? Everything I've ever done is I've transferred my energy back towards them. Um, not like I'm not a troublemaker. I'm not trying to say I've caused trouble with these judges and stuff. But what I've realised is that I'm the highest power because I'm hurting no one. A statue, a statue is not even law. I haven't caused anybody. I've not, I've, um, there's no injured party, I've not done anything wrong to anyone. So how can I get took to court for, for instance, uh, uh, driving, I set my driving licence back about five or six years ago. Driving without a licence. Well, why do I need permission to go from point A to point B? Um, and so these are the type of things I was getting arrested for. But um, I've won uh, the debt scam. Um, I've got rid of thousands of pounds that are alleged debt that I supposedly owed. Uh, and I've of course conflict. And this is what I'm coming to now about being sovereign, being the highest power, not causing harm to anyone. All I do is, if somebody's got authority over me, or is claiming something off me, all I say to them is, well, I don't want to fall out with you. I can't remember if I borrowed 10 grand, or I can't remember doing so and so. Do me a favour, just show me a bit of proof. And I'll, I'll whether it's a cop, I've sent five judges' orders back, and never heard anything again. Um, and all I've done is tell people, whoever it is, is do me a favour, show me a bit of proof for what you're saying is right. If you claim you've got authority over me, show me that you've got it, and I'll do as you say. And I've carried on that through every walk of life that I've done. I've had some great results. So what I'm saying is, when they see that I've lost that fear, um, it they get empowered by us being fearful. So we, we want to live fearless, not fearful. And what happens is, when you don't show them fear, they become disempowered. And that's why what's happened to me. Um, from now on, in fact, everybody hates me in my town. Not us lot, but all them lot hate me in my town. And the reason being is I'm not frightened of them. And because I'm not frightened, um, none of the none of this shit that they're doing has any effect on me now. Now everybody leaves me alone now. Uh, the only thing I pay for is my mortgage, and I'm going to be sorting that out now. So what I'm trying to say is, you can beat this fear-based system by I recognise who, who and what I am. I also, I've got a force field around me. I know that. Um, in fact, I'll tell you now. Uh, I, I might as well tell you. I was helping some people who were unemployed who have benefits. And the benefits, they were missing appointments, the benefits got taken away from them. And I got um, a couple of people said, can you help us out? So I had a look at it and I found a statue that's theirs and I threw it back at them. And what it basically said, basically said in the statute that I found that they created is that whoever's claiming the benefit is a beneficiary of the trust and can never have it taken away. So I helped these two people out by notifying the Department of Work and Pensions, I'll say for the camera, by notifying the Department of Work and Pensions of this particular act, it's a little section, I know some people have read it, um, saying it's impossible to take the money away, and if you do, the beneficiary of a trust, it can't be taken away. Even if they become bankrupt, it can never, this, it's inalienable, it can never be taken away, and it's their law, and I fired it back at them. Um, I sent some notices off, which I didn't reply to, and within two weeks, I ended up with a death threat delivered to my garden. In fact, I brought it to my bag here. And it was a, uh, a petrol bomb, basically, with a notice around it, um, stenciled in red, saying, um, stop now or next time, boom. In other words, I'd found this little tiny section, two lines long, um, Social Security Administration Act, 1992, section 187. I found it, two lines long. I'll write it down for a go. I've thrown it back at them. There's now, I had two options when I got this death threat. I, I, I had a word with two good friends and I said, what do you think? I, uh, by the way, I live on my own with two kids. I've got no one to look after us. Um, it will push through into my garden on top of my wheelie bin. 
for helping these people sending these notices. This is what I'm talking about, fear. So I went to two close friends and I said, what do you think you ought to do? And they said, you've got two options. I either stop now and call it a day because I've done a lot of stuff or um, spread it out as far as possible to protect yourself. So I did nothing for about six weeks and I thought, shit to this. And what I did is, uh, I went on Get Out of Debt Free. I don't know if anybody, does anybody get on Get Out of Debt Free? Yeah. yeah. I went, you'll, see the post, you'll see my post on there. I went on there, <coughs> I went to as many chat rooms and websites as possible, and I spread the fucking thing everywhere. Good. And now there's hundreds and hundreds of people now writing to DWP. Basically, that's our money and they're stealing it off us. They're making us beg for our own money. And I've proved that they cannot take that away. So now, maybe even thousands now, people are actually looking at it. In fact, some people have had results with it already, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. Okay, just, just briefly, I'll move on to something else. So from the death threat, which I've got, you've got to take a death threat seriously. Uh, and my, my, my garden's got high gates and it's really awkward to get to. So you have to take a bit of a chance coming to my house at five o'clock in the morning. Um, then, next stage, uh, I got my internet wires cut from me outside my house. Uh, like a virgin box, but for the camera, if anyone's watching later on, it's not active, I don't have virgin media anymore anyway, so they kept chopping me internet wires. Um, three o'clock in the morning, so I've, got, I've just got two windows on the street, I've got no door. Somebody's thrown at three o'clock in the morning, a full tin of black gloss plate all over the window. Um, two months later, I sent another notice off, um, helping these people. Um, and two days later, another gloss paint on another window. Um, I've had my email account hacked. I've had viruses sent to my computer, and it's all since I started doing this. So what I'm trying to say to you, they've gone from, we are going to blow you up, stop now, to fucking throwing bits of paint on my window. Well, I won't mind it. It's not, it's not a bad colour. It's just not finished it off properly. <laughs> I don't mind black windows. It looks all right, I think. So what I'm saying is, they tried the most fearful thing to me, and it's gone, they're going backwards now. Um, and snipping the internet wires and taking, snipping me, oh, wow, so what? Let's go back on the internet again, don't I? So what I'm trying to show, what I'm trying to say is, a lot of people, and um, fair play to them, would have panicked on Monday at that point. You've got to take a death threat pretty serious, haven't you, when you're living on your own with two kids, you're a single parent. But I realised that the only fear is what's in here. Now that was supposed to make me frightened to death. Every year, uh, sorry, last two Christmases, I've challenged the only bill I've, well, the only proper um, alleged debt I've got left is a mortgage, and I keep challenging them. And the last two Christmases, the mortgage people keep trying to repossess my house. And I expect them again this year, and they've not come. And I've beaten them last twice, but all it is is, you look how many house, houses get repossessed just before Christmas. It's all to instill all this fear. It's all about fear. Um, and they've not come this year. And once again, I'll, I always, um, I always get results. I always beat them. I don't even like to say I'm beating them. The, no, nah, it's wrong terminology. I don't beat them, but I don't lose to them. And what I do is I always stand in honour. I don't argue with them, and I just say, prove what you're claiming. And what's happened is, they've got fed up with mortgage, they're leaving me alone this year, so I've, I've got a nice Christmas this year. But the point is, I'm never frightened. I knew, I would, first time, I would never get kicked out of my house. I knew second time, I expected them this year. Um, I got arrested for driving whilst disqualified. They tried to give me six months prison. I ended up defending myself in court against a Crown Prosecution Service barrister, top man. F- uh, all because I wouldn't give details. I got four charges, driving with no insurance, not giving me details, a uh, bold tyre and the big one driving whilst disqualified. They said, if you don't plead guilty, we're going to give you six months prison. I kept adjourning it and I finally went to a three, uh, three hour trial Again, it's all about fear, uh, and I beat them on all four counts. They found me guilty, and then took no action whatsoever. So what I'm saying is, this fear thing, it's a load of bollocks. It's all in your mind. Uh, I've seen people here, I'm really proud, I've got to know some lovely people here. Uh, this lady here has done some fantastic work here. And I think you'll agree it's about fear, isn't it? It's about, it's about realising what that fear is, isn't it? Um, Fear's a fear's created by them and it plays on your mind and like I said it is a war, it's a war for your mind. And once you realise what fear is then nothing can harm you. If you sit there all day long um, thinking about fear and it, and it takes a bit of practice, I'm not saying never be scared of anything, the fucking lion jumps out, I'm off like, you know what I mean? But other than that, don't, um, you get, you got to learn to recognise what fear is and fear is if you're operating from here, if you're operating from your heart, 
If something, always, always think, does it feel right? If something feels right, your mind can talk you out of it. If it feels right, then go with it and keep going with things until they don't feel right. But what happens is, this is never, never frightened, is it? This can't get frightened. It's this that gets frightened. And it's implanted by their, their manipulation to make you frightened in your mind. And what happens is, again, it's ego mind. It, it, it plays to your ego and your ego talks you in and out of doing things because that fear grows inside. And you can only be scared in here, you can't be scared in here. And like I said, once you recognise that nothing can happen to you, um, if you sit there worrying all the time, your immune system shuts down, this is why stress kills you. You end up getting really ill, but what you are then doing is drawing, because you're negative, you're drawing whatever can happen, there's a good chance it is going to happen because you're drawing it to you. Where, when you do the opposite, like I do, and say, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm not hurting anyone. I'll try every single day to help. If I, I'll try and help somebody every single day of my life. And if I have a thought, it's never a nasty thought, it's to try and help someone. So whatever I'm living like that, um, I won't be attracting that fear to me. And that's what I said, like I've almost got a force field around me. Everything they try and do to me, it doesn't work. And it's not because I'm super clever, and it's not because I'm super special. It's because I fucking realise what fear is. And all it is, is it's an implant in your mind to back down, to, to close down, and then everything gets on top of you. And once you recognise just doing what you are, that fear becomes laughable. <coughs> oh, good, right, I found this. Um, I can't remember who sent me this. It might have been my mate Andy over there who sent me this. Uh, laughter. We were just talking about this with Doug earlier, my brother. Um, how do you lose fear? Well, like I said, you recognise what, what you are. Okay, we all should be now recognising what we're here for. We're here to create to create and produce, creator, remember, we are an exact copy, fractal, we're exact copy of creator, in his image or its image, and we're here to create, that's what we're here for, to create, produce, create, produce, help each other, um, and evolve spiritually by having an experience here, that's what we're here for. So I'll just tell you this about laughter, and then I'll read you a poem, uh, and a little speech by me, and I'll fuck off. Okay, this is about laughter. Uh, and again, um, I've got some friends here in the audience, and when I get letters and bills and scary things, or um, and we're going to come and lock you up, and we're going to, and I, first thing I do, and that energy thing, remember that energy thing I was telling you, first thing I do is laugh. Okay, first it's forced. You always, um, I think, three and a half thousand pound gas bill, I think I got up to. You always, such a trouble, coming to bed, to come in tomorrow, we're going to empty all your stuff. First thing I do is I force myself to laugh. Ha 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 ha. Your mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your mind doesn't know the difference between a forced laughter and real laughter. And what you do is, if you can force yourself, I'm to this side of it. Uh, if you can force yourself to laugh, it ends up becoming a real laugh. Now that vibration is different to the fear they're trying to instill. So I'll just tell you this about laughter. Read you a lovely poem that I didn't write. That's why it's lovely. A little speech by me, and that's it. Right. Okay. Laughter. Get this. Research indicates that we think over 50,000 thoughts a day. Do you know? Uh, it's believed that the average adult fills, um, fills a man with 80% of the same thoughts from yesterday. Wow. So 80% of today's thoughts are from yesterday. Oh, have you fell asleep, bro? Oh, she's asleep. Are you okay? Sorry. <laughs> Nearly done. You weren't snoring, don't worry. Um, yeah, 80% of the same thoughts from yesterday. This means that 40% of your thoughts today are the same. Sorry, this means that 40,000 of your thoughts today are the same as yesterday. Well, that's unbelievable, isn't it? Um, science has also proven it's impossible to laugh and think at the same time. Do you know? <laughs> it's right though, isn't it? If you're laughing your head off, you're not thinking, are you? Because you're just laughing, aren't you? So you can't think and laugh at the same time. That's interesting. Uh, you may think you're thinking when you're laughing because thoughts can come um, very quickly after laughter, but you're not. Uh, so if you need a break from thinking, I know a lot of people are thinking and thinking, it's all about laughter. Okay. The good news is that everyone can laugh. All oh, right, I didn't know that. Yeah, everyone can laugh. Uh, you don't even need to be happy or feel good at first. You don't need a sense of humour. Okay. Um, and any time is a good time to laugh. Human beings were wired to laugh. Laughter is universal language, same as the music. Okay. Every culture laughs. And even better is that the human mind doesn't know the difference between fake and real laughter, which is what I said. Um, the, get this, the sad news is that a five-year-old laughs on average, a five-year-old laughs 400 times a day, and by the time we become an adult, we laugh an average of 15 times a day. 
So that's why kids live in the moment, don't they? That's why they're happy. Kids, kids on average laugh 400 times a day, we laugh 15 times a day. Unless you live in our house, it's fucking hilarious. Um, <laughs> where were I? Studies, studies have shown that a baby can laugh a full three months before um, he or she has the ability to utter sounds. So even before a baby can speak or utter sounds, it can laugh. Um, so we've all, been at, we've all been able to access the wonderful power of laughter since almost birth, nearly done. Excuse me. In the past, healthy, oh, healthy. In the past, happy, healthy humans were said to spend 20 minutes a day or more in laughter. The US is ranked only number 23, 23 in the world in regards to the happiness factor. Okay, oh, you know, it's, factor, it's happiness factor now. Um, <coughs> statistically, I can't say that word, one out of five women in America are currently taking antidepressants and men aren't far behind, this is what they want. They want us to live in fear, they want us to be depressed, the immune system shuts down and we're in a state, aren't we? Well, believe it or not, some of the sim laughter is the best medicine they say, don't they? Okay, there's something called laughter yoga. I don't know how good it is. Sounds bollocks, but it might work. Um, it says here, a regular 45 minute laughter session. 45 minutes is a long time to be laughing, isn't it? Um, a regular 45 minute laughter session can have a positive effect on overall health and well-being, physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, belly laughs result in muscle relaxation. Of course, if you're doing that, then it's gonna relax after, isn't it? So that makes sense. Uh, after you finish laughing, those muscles involved in the laughter start to relax. Laughter rebalances cell chemistry caused by stress, pain, and affects every major body system. Okay. Laughter rebalances cell chemistry caused by stress. Interesting. Move that, move that. Intellectually, laughter involves the whole brain and serves to integrate and balance activity in both hemispheres. Oh, interesting. So both hem hemispheres get you know, the right brain, left brain sides. Both hemispheres get stimulated by laughter. Brilliant. <coughs> so the more you can laugh, the less fear you've got. That sounds silly, but once you get into habit of laughing, I forgot how to laugh a few years ago. Things were that depressing. Um, I forgot how to laugh. Um, and only when I took my kids on six six years ago, they were only quite young then, that they retaught me this, this gift that we lose from being kids, like we said, so many hundred times a day to look if you laugh, I don't know, look if you laugh 10 times a day. Looking after my kids and watching them playing and stuff and having to get involved because I became a single parent then taught me how to laugh. And this laughing thing is what gets rid of fear. So I'm going to finish up now. Not written by me. This is by Thomas Buchanan. Okay. Don't know when it was written, but I thought it was very applicable um, for today. There's a word in this called upharsing. Upharsing. And upharsing means a warning of disaster. So I'll read you this point, a little bit of a speech, and I'm Say good night. Okay, it says, um, <coughs> it says, Oh, joy to the world, the hour is come, when nations to freedom awake, when royalists stand agape and dumb, and monarchs with terror shake. This is where I think we are nowadays, right now. Over the walls of majesty, upharsing is written words of fire, and the bondsmen, wherever they may be, are lit with wild desire. Soon shall the thrones that block the world like the Orleans into the dust be hurled, and the world will roll on like a hurricane's breath, till the farthest slave hears what it saith, arise, 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 and be free. And that's what it's all about. It's happening now, monarchs are coming down, the Vatican's coming down, <coughs> corporations are losing their grip on everything, and it's down to the collective effort of what we're doing. Sometime in, I don't know, and people think, oh, um, Truthful moment, there's not enough, we need a critical mass, the critical mass is there. I don't know whether we need to join together, whether we need to put the energy out. What we do need to do is spread this information that Mark's put out, that some other great researchers are putting out. Who wrote that poem? That was by uh, Thomas Buchanan. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that it was recognised, I don't know where this point is from, that all systems of hierarchy are psychopathic in nature and it's coming down. And there's only a handful of us compared to the world's population. Sometime in a hundred years time, two hundred years time, whatever it was, somebody will remember that you, you, me, us, and many others, pioneers, pi more than pioneers, stood up, recognised the shit for what it were, looked at our kids and other people's kids, and thought, "Fuck this, we're not taking this anymore. We've had enough shit. We're going to move on in 2014. Not aggressive." It's all about energy, it's all about living in honour, 
doing what's right, and recognising the oppression, that it's a fear-based oppression, and that if you're doing nothing wrong, you're causing harm to no one, nobody's going to tell you what to do on this planet. So thanks a lot for listening. Cheers. Right, thanks, thanks. Okay, we're pressing the record conference. All done. Right, so guys, uh, again, thank you to Mark Cooking and to Rob Freeman again, please. Thank you to everybody for turning up.